Aliens and Steph Neaton. First of all, I'll introduce myself. My name is Joan Collins. I'm the TD in the Dublin South Central Area. Um, and this issue has come up over the last few months, and I raised it in a doy with the Tomish to Joan Gordon in November. Um, and either Joan Gordon pled or pledged to ignorance, um, or she genuinely didn't know anything about the transatlantic um, investment programme or partnership. Um, but uh, she certainly didn't know exactly what we were talking about when we posted her, what it was, the impact it would have on societies in general, and particularly in Ireland. Um, now from that there's been a lot of meetings going on in unions and NGOs, not just here in Ireland but across Europe in relation to the TTIP and also CETA, which is the Canadian um, uh, Trade Agreement. Um, and what I want to try and do then, we were talking to a number of people, about how to get it out into the open, more public, about what exactly is going on behind closed doors, what secret deals are being made um, in, in, with certain groups of people um, and not coming out into, into the open. And that's why we decided to call this meeting, and I was delighted that both um, Unite um, Mandate and the TWU um, are, are endorsing the meeting here tonight, um, and I can see a number of people from NGOs and that. I'm also delighted that uh, Frank Kogan here, who was the president of the TWU, is going to speak about um, the cons of uh, um, the TTIP and explain exactly what are as much as we know behind the scenes of TTIP. And also Constantine Gurdjieff is here tonight. And the reason why I asked and um, invited Constantine is that we were down in Ballyhay before Christmas at the, the March, the Ballyhay March. And um, someone came up to me and said, like, I'm really concerned about TTIP. And, I said, yeah, I'm opposed to it, and Constantine mentioned that he supported it, so I said it'd be good to try and get a debate going about it, because sometimes I think we can talk to our own people, and we're not developing ideas, and we're not thinking about it outside the box, and um, challenging our own you know, arguments and our own ideas around issues, so that's why we called the, I called the meeting tonight. I hope it's going to be a good one, I hope it's going to be a good debate, and um, we want to sort of keep it fairly informal, open it up for uh, questions after our two speakers, we're going to speak for about... 20 to 25 minutes, um, <laughs> and, and uh, that I think we will be a good place. I mean, to see how the meeting rolls and what we get out of it, and is there anything that we can get out of the end of the meeting uh, uh, for, for, uh, from the discussion and debate. So, Frank, you want to come in yeah. first? Yeah. And then we're going to have Constantine. As I said, to them very much. I'd like to give a warm welcome to us. <laughs> Thank you very much, and thank you, John. Um, I've got 25 minutes, I'm going to just time from this. Excuse me for a moment. So, um, first of all, can you hear me down the back? <laughs> Grant. Um, corporate paragraph. TTIP, EU-US agreement, and CETA, the corresponding Canadian-US agreement. So is it a trade deal? And this is a very uh, pertinent question, because the main goal, as you can see, is to remove regulatory barriers. Uh, and these regulatory barriers are things which we have fought for over the years, social measures, etc. Um, and some of our most prized social standards, as I say in the slide, but also they want to create new markets by opening up public services and government procurement contracts at the competition from transnational companies. Now, the TTIP can be broken down into three distinct parts. That's ISDS, which is uh, Interstate Dispute Settlement, Regulation and Privatisation, which has jobs, of course, tagged on. And this ISDS is something that I will talk about at some length. It's the one that has got the most publicity. And this is the one that grants foreign investors a right to sue a sovereign government. And this case will occur before an ad hoc arbitration tribunal. Uh, and it will challenge public policy decisions, many of which are important for us in our day-to-day -day life. So my point is that it's not a trade agreement as you would normally think of a trade agreement, which would be setting quotas, reducing tariffs, etc. But it's really a discussion between 
corporate entities on both sides of the Atlantic in order to uh, form an agreement which will serve their interests um, as they see fit almost, as I'll see later on. So to determine who's involved, uh, we looked at who was involved in the preparatory meetings in Brussels, and 92% of those were business groups. There were no unions, NGOs, etc., etc., involved. Um, it was a very heavy concentration on corporate representation. And similarly in Washington, 85%, somewhat less, um, possibly owing to the attitude of the uh, present administration there. And you can imagine in a situation like that that uh, concerns surrounding health, uh, workers' rights, etc., would certainly take second place. And that picture gives you a fair idea of what happened in the EU Commission. We do have a lot more information, by the way, about what happened in the EU Commission than what happened in the United States. So is it transparent? Initially, the Commission placed very, very strict restrictions on the documents, on the access to the documents. Um, in Brussels. Uh, there was a, a Fort Knox type room that a certain number of people were allowed into or searched, etc., etc., uh, were not allowed to copy anything, and so on. But there has been a, a very significant campaign throughout the EU, civil society groups, and the negotiated mandate was released, which gave us a lot of information about what might be in it. It had been leaked twice already. Uh, WikiLeaks was involved in it as well. And since then, more has been released. That's, uh, John Todd Juncker, I'm horrified at having to release this stuff. And this is part of their new uh, openness and transparency. They had a two minute clip of the negotiators in the room. Uh, there was no sound with the clip, but you saw these people kind of sitting there looking at one another, basically. Um, the information, however, that they released means that we have a fair idea of what they're looking for. The proposition papers, for example, explain the EU's approach in a number of areas, a number of sectors even. And to give you a reader's guide, which you may remember the reader's guide to the Lisbon Treaty, uh, which is read out altogether. But unfortunately, no consolidated negotiation texts, and recently there has been a good bit of pressure on the Obama administration to release uh, their demands, but nothing is happening, and he has specifically said he's not going to release anything. This is the investor state dispute settlement. Oh, it's, uh, hmm, it's wrong where. Anyway, that's, that's not a That's not worried about uh, this is showing the increase in investor state dispute settlement cases since 1987. You can see the concentration is at this end here, since about 2008. And this is the one that allows uh, transnational corporations to sue individual states. Um, I would call it, and somebody else would call it as well, corporate sovereignty. Um, and this is uh, for losses that they say they have suffered within that state as a result of public policy decisions. And I think this is uh, unparalleled in its implications. It's, it's, Ireland does not have an IDS, ISDS clause in any of the agreements it might have with other countries. Um, that was confirmed by the department well, only yesterday in a statement they made. So um, it, it does give transnational corporations a legal status which is equal to the nation state. And these 12 tribunals, there's no appeal. There's no appeal from them. The arbitrators can determine compensation and allocation of costs. Costs about 4 million for each case. And the arbitration tribunals stipulated by most treaties are the World Bank's, World Bank's International Centre for Settlement of Investment Disputes. And this is their little document over here, the convention. So three private sector lawyers who are also allowed to operate as corporate adv advocates. And they have a vested interest simply because if there's no case, they don't get paid. And this is their job. So they have an interest in actually ensuring that the cases go ahead. They also have a, a role in deciding whether the case is frivolous or not. And you can see that in that situation where they are depending on the case going ahead, that they certainly would, there's no known case, let's say, of them deciding that a case is, is a frivolous case taken by a company. No conflict of interest rules, and the jurisprudence is essentially arbitrary. Now, expropriation is what they, they claim when they take a case against the country, and it's been expanded under TTIP, and it now includes measures tantamount to expropriation, indirect expropriation, regulatory expropriation, and it goes on and on. 
Um, and really, in the end, there are such a range of interpretations that can be put on the expropriation that companies will find a way. And at the moment, we have the situation where these lawyers are uh, scavenging, really, on countries that are in financial difficulty, uh, where companies have lost because of either devaluation or some other issue, uh, and or they've lost their bonds because there's a haircut, and these corporate lawyers are pursuing cases like that around the world at the moment. And of course, the repatriation of profits. I'll, I'm going to pass that by because it's a little bit technical. The other thing that might happen is that uh, regulatory chill is something which has been identified as an effect of the ISDS, and it's a bit like the uh, Japan Tobacco Company, who threatened to sue the Irish government that brought in planned packaging. Uh, they hope that the government will refrain from doing it uh, get in the, because they might anticipate a serious case developing. So that could be used as a bargaining chip, uh, and regulatory chill is a very serious effect because it dampens down uh, legislative uh, innovation, let's put it that way, on the part of governments. And uh, the EU Commission itself advocates that a consultation forum called the Regulatory Cooperation Council be set up that would tell notified parties in advance of any legislation that might be coming up. And I'll deal with it in a bit more detail later on. The regulatory convergence is a series of processes, and uh, any of them maybe at any stage, at any, yes, at any stage, at any point in time. The first one is mutual recognition between both the US and the EU in this case, and that would allow goods or food or whatever uh, into the EU as long as it conformed to US standards. So you would then have a situation under mutual recognition where EU produced food, for example, produced to EU standards would be for sale alongside uh, US food and vice versa, of course. And then harmonization, and uh, pesticides is a very good example, probably. Uh, harmonization is where the EU standards would then change to match the US standards or another agreed standard. And given that, uh, in the case of pesticides and chemicals, chemicals I should say specifically, um, something like 84,000 chemicals have been introduced in the United States uh, in the last 20 years, and only six of them are controlled. Food and Drug Administration, that case. And then the most dangerous one, in my view, regulatory cooperation, which will be a continuous process uh, after TTIP is signed, if it's signed, this will be a continuous process that will go on more or less behind closed doors, and anything that has deemed a barrier to trade will be up for grabs. And if it is a barrier to trade, then within the regulatory uh, cooperation council, or board as it's now called, uh, this will be brought up and we'll never see the light of day. So it will be a severe restriction on government's regulation. Uh, this is a streamlined procedure, but the one thing I want to bring to your attention is not entailing domestic ratification procedures. So it will be hidden. We won't know what's happening. Joint proposals will be made to the, uh, at the committee, the stakeholders, the people who run the committee will be the US government and the EU commission. And the forewarning will be given one year ahead, um, the public will know about that as well. We'll release to the public once a year a program outlining the planning and ongoing regulatory cooperation activities and objectives and reporting on the implementation of sectoral undertakings and other priority actions. EU speak for, you're not going to find out anything at all about the working groups themselves, and there'll be no oversight at all of the RCC uh, presently proposed. So, what will happen is the corporations will get advance notice. If they don't like it, they'll object to it in there. Uh, and they'll, obviously, at that stage, the, the council is obliged to take their objections into account. If they bring new proposals, they're also obliged to take those into account and to act on them. So it's a, a huge issue, this. Uh, this is what I would call a ratcheting mechanism, a continual revision of regulations governing a wide range of, uh, of issues, such as food, chemicals, etc. Et the EU at the moment operates the cautionary principle, and the US has specifically said that they will target EU regulations that block US food exports. And these, within the 
uh, EU to establish the standard uh, reliant on precautionary principle. And that means that a product can be withdrawn from the market if there's a risk it may pose dangers to human health, even if there's insufficient scientific evidence. Uh, and uh, this is a little sketch I found. It took me a long time to find something that was a bit of These are frogs. The two frogs in the middle are in the boiling water and the, in the saucepan and saying, prove we'll be boiled alive. And that is uh, the American attitude. And over on the other side is the other acute frog putting his toe in the water saying, prove we won't. But the critical thing about the principle as applied by the EU, the precautionary principle, is that it transfers the burden of proof to any company which seeks to market a potentially dangerous product and the company is required to prove that it is safe. That is the exact opposite of the American. I put in Mrs. Merkel with the chicken because uh, this has been a big controversy to whom can uh, in, uh, in Germany, because um, the U.S. <laughs> there's another problem, unfortunately. The, um, the EU operates a farm to fork principle, and there are very high, well, there are high, I should say, uh, standards applied to uh, chickens uh, from the farm to fork. But in America, they don't apply high hygiene standards, and they wash them with chlorine. Um, this has been a very famous sort of case, uh, particularly in Germany. We don't want the chlorine chickens. But regulatory convergence um, can only be concluded to bring EU standards closer to US standards. US standards are lower, EU standards are higher. So where does it end up? Well, maybe it ends up in the middle, but it is very unlikely because the pressure, uh, market pressures alone, would suggest that it goes the other way. The traditionally, the EU have adopted an approach uh, in trade agreements, um, and this approach um, is a positive list approach. In other words, uh, items that are open to public competition or to, uh, yeah, I'll say public competition for the moment, um, are listed. But TTIP, well, we know for a fact, I should say, that the Canadian Agreement has adopted the negative list approach. And that means that all the service sectors are surrendered to liberalisation unless they're specifically marked out as exceptions. This is the exact opposite of what it has been before, or here before. So this is a dramatic shift away in the Canadian model from the old EU system. And in effect, most of the sectors now are forward, are, are within the Canadian agreement are put forward for inclusion and opened up to competition from foreign firms, in this case Canadians, or US firms with Canadian subsidiaries. Uh, this looks like very dense sort of print, uh, but this is the Irish reservations applicable to seat. And you can see cross-border provision of the supply of executive search services, really, okay, fair enough, provision of investment services, investment advice, and down here, the economic needs test for intercity busing services. And this one here has some torches. Our own reserves the right to adopt and maintain any measure with respect to the provision of privately funded social services other than services relating to convalescent and rest houses and all people's homes. Everything else is up for grabs. Everything else is up for grabs for the American corporations. And with American corporations, subsidiaries in Canada or Canadian companies. And we can anticipate something similar in TTA. And that's the actual document uh, in the Canadian Agreement, Annex 2. And you probably can't read it from there, but that's it anyway. So we know from CETA, the EU Canada Agreement, which is now public, has been public since um, over time, that there are exclusions from health, from health, for health, I should say, uh, when it comes to market access. There's no exclusion in the investment chapter which, like TTIP, includes ISDS. So it's a bit of a smash and grab. But I just remind people that there are no provisions at all in these agreements on investors' obligations, only on the rights of investments. Of investors. So a little bit about labour standards. Uh, I believe that it would lead to a downgrading of labour standards, because a lot of them will be identified as barriers to trade. <coughs> Collective labour agreements will be under threat, uh, there's no doubt about that. Possibly by, on, as a result of omission by governments, it would be under threat. 
And we know that the ILO has refused to, uh, to uh, ratify some basic ILO convention, conventions on labour standards, uh, things like collective bargaining, freedom of association, etc. And that the right to work campaign in America, which has a severe effect on union finances, they must defend people that are not even in unions, is now been moved to, has now been adopted in about half the states. I think yesterday Wisconsin adopted it. So it's a big um, push and a big rest at the bottom, in fact. Now, Minister Bruton is very optimistic. He talks about 0.5% uh, added to EU GDP and 400,000 extra jobs. He didn't say how many in this country. But he's awaiting the report of the Amsterdam Group. Isn't that what it's called? Copenhagen Group. Uh, the Copenhagen Group, which will report sometime um, in the next two months. Now, the European Commission has said that the basis on which Mr. Rudin is making his estimates is unrealistically high. And this is the, uh, the um, IF, IFO Institute in Munich. So, but it nevertheless is presented by him as being a realistic alternative. There's another uh, study has come out recently by this chap Capaldo, who's a, a specialist with the ILO, uh, but he works in uh, Tufts University, I think, or, mm -hmm. as far as I remember. And he says things like there will be a severe loss of, of labour income. He picks Germany, he looks at a number of countries, not Ireland, uh, they lose 3,400 euros a year. Job losses, he sees 600,000 uh, loss in the EU, and a reduction in labour share. In other words, a continual drift of the share of of GDP to uh, capital away from lead. And it looks at like Britain, lose it, the workers losing 7%, and in France, 8%. And this CEPR study for the EU Commission said that 1.3 million, and the EU Commission has quoted this on quite a number of occasions and has adopted it as their um, study, as it were. Uh, they have actually presented it as the truth sometimes, even though uh, there's a lot of it could be questioned. But they said that 1.3 million workers would be displaced or lose their jobs. And the Commission has said we can use the European Globalisation Fund or the Social Fund, which has been bumped up by 70 million uh, up until 2000, 2020. Now, this uh, CEPR, which is the Commission's uh, preferred one, uh, estimates that the wages will increase at the same rate of GDP and heat pace of productivity changes and the share of wages and profits in GDP will remain the same. Now, anybody who's looked at the last 30 years would not be assured that that could actually happen, simply because between, uh, in, in the 15, the EU 15, in the last 30 years, the share of labor has, has declined from 67% in the mid-70s down to 57% in 2007, and we could realistically expect that by 2027, that would be back down another 10% or more. And we know that TTIP will change freedom of movement for direct investment and the bargaining power of corporations against labour will certainly increase under those circumstances. So the, I would say that the, this CEPR model, which was used by the Commission, casts doubt on the basic underlying rationale for the trade deal at all, which is to help it pull us out of the, the recession um, and make us all happy again. This is it attempts to re replicate an economy going through a series of complex formulas and predict the trade flows. But to start with the assumption of fixed full employment and end with the assumption of fixed of, of full employment. Now we all know how difficult it is to move the employment statistics in the EU over the last 10 years, uh, even, even longer, uh, and how they imagine that this could actually happen under uh, a trade deal like this is just I'll say more about it later on, because obviously somebody will want to ask a question about it. So, the studies under this CEPR model are not focused on the labour market, and, well, it does also ignore regional variation. There's a lot of disagreement about how to measure the impact of the elimination of non-tariff barriers. And non-tariff barriers are the, the barriers to trade, essentially, uh, things like uh, regulation, state industry, etc. And the EU's own study says that the gains for the EU will be 0.5% in GDP growth over 10 years. And this is often quoted, 544 euro in disposable income for a family of four. And even if you accept that that's the situation and that a lot does not go to profit, but goes to families, 
It's an average for a start, but secondly, it comes down to two euro sixty per week, and you know what that is? That's a cup of coffee each on Saturday morning for the family of all. That's who's down there at the bottom, and that's a lot to give up for a cup of coffee in a week if you think about it. And that's the most optimistic. They have a least favourable and a most favourable outcome, and this is the most favourable outcome in the Commission's own study. The US Department of Agriculture looked at uh, TPP, which is the Trans-Pacific, uh, similar Trans-Pacific one, and said it would have zero impact on US GDP. And they said it would have zero impact because of the adjustment costs. In other words, paying unemployment benefit, all sorts of grants to get people to move their factories, etc., etc. And that model looked at the elimination, the complete elimination of all tariffs and tariff-based quotas. In other words, down to zero. And the CEPR study, the one that the Commission pushes, said that tariff rates between the EU and the US are at 3%. Very, very low indeed. But that the most important outcome from TTIP will be the reduction in non-tariff barriers. And now up to 80% of the expected gain will come from that particular area. And what's happening with CETA? Very briefly, uh, or what's happening with CETA? It depends on the outcome at the moment of uh, a case in the ECJ. <coughs> there is a similar agreement, EU-Singapore agreement, and there are two, there's a type of agreement called a mixed agreement, which requires that the individual member states make a decision on the outcome of it. So what, that is what's at issue in the ECJ, ECJ case, case containing an IDS provision, and uh, whether it can be approved simply by the EU Council and the EU Parliament, or whether it has to go to individual member states. We have Germany and France's dithering, you know, read some of the data suggest they're dithering, uh, said they want to reopen CETA to change this ISDS provision, and Denmark, Luxembourg, and a number of others are also concerned. And Greece said that they're prepared to veto. What do we see? We see. Now, all the Official impact studies are one-sided. They only concern with the cost of regulation and not with the benefits. But this is uh, from the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs in the US. They're actually involved in the negotiations themselves. And this is their little graph uh, from 2000 to 2012. And the black bit is the benefit from regulation and the gray bit is the cost of regulation. So why would you want to get rid of regulation if you can produce graphs like that? Benefits are six times six times, they said, larger than the actual costs. And you can talk about trying to get rid of PCBs and all sorts of things, the enormous amounts of money, 15 billion has cost the EU so far to dispose of, the, of PCBs, these poisonous chemicals that we're using, things like transformers and so on. So the threats from TTIP are very, very real indeed. And the benefits are, that's, that's my time up, yeah. just, just about finished, just about finished. <laughs> <laughs> we had a big argument about this earlier. <laughs> I want it longer. Um, genuine trade deals can benefit workers. I think that, that is true. And trade deals need rules. So uh, we shouldn't be against trade deals per se. Um, some people say that trade is better than war. Uh, but not these sort of rules. These rules are designed solely for the benefit of corporations. And we have to think of ordinary people who have to live with these deals. And we don't want corporate power the absolute dominant force in society. So I would say that TTIP and CETA should be scrapped. I've talked about regulatory convergence. And this is, I think, ISDS gets most of the press. But I think that the regulation issue is an extraordinarily important issue. It affects so many areas of our lives. It's something that we should become engaged with. If you're interested in the environment, you're interested in practically fracking, you're interested in so many things. This is going to affect your area of interest, your concerns. It's going to change your concerns beyond recognition of your, your, the area in which you're interested, beyond recognition. And I think it's, it behoves us all to make a value judgment on this, and to talk to our friends about it after we've made our judgments, and to encourage them, if they're opposed, I would say, to show their opposition, and to show it vocally. Thank you. <laughs>